All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thanks to the organizers for inviting me here to talk about decompression methods. This isn't going to be specific to rebreathers. It's going to be somewhat specific to technical diving, you know, whether that's open circuit or rebreathers. Really, uh, you breathe in, you breathe out, you take up gas and you've got to get rid of it. It's all the same, irrespective of, of your diving modes. There are some little nuances with rebreathers and we might address some of those. My name's David Doulette. I presently work at the US Navy Experimental Diving Unit, where I am responsible for the development of decompression procedures, um, development and testing, with, uh, and I have a bit of a sideline in man testing of rebreathers there as well. I'm myself a diver, technical diver, cave diver, rebreather diver, that sort of thing. Been diving a little over 30 years. I've been in, interested in decompression since the day one of my buddies got bent and uh, and I didn't because I didn't think that happened but obviously we all now know that that does happen. I A, a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about is going to be work that we've done in the US Navy, largely at the Experimental Diving Unit, also at some other places. The US Navy has been a huge contributor to, to decompression research over the last hundred years. By no means the only contributor but, but a very large one. It's a Navy picture of a hard hat diver. So we're going to have, we're going to talk about decompression theory, we're going to talk a little bit about methods as they relate to, to the sort of things that you people have available to you um, in dive computers and desktop decompression software, how they work, and then we're going to look at some um, particular, two particular issues um, that I think are relevant to technical diving these days. One's deep stops, one's gas switching from, from heliox to, to nitrox. Start off, decompression sickness is, is an injury of the industrial age, you have to have be able to change pressure quickly, either by being able to dive underwater or go to high altitude. If you're diving underwater, um, you breathe in gas at increased pressure that absorbs into your body. Uh, when you decompress, that gas has to come out of your body and it does so, some of it comes out in the, of your tissues in the form of bubbles and enough bubbles will cause decompression sickness or can cause decompression sickness. Everyone at some point in their diving career has seen this beer bottle analogy, and it is a great one. Uh, it's sort of a, a model of decompression sickness. We've got a, a, a bottle here with liquid in it. Um, we have a gas space here. It's, this is sealed, and this gas, which is carbon dioxide if it's a beer bottle, is under pressure. And because it's under pressure, carbon dioxide is dissolved at a fairly high concentration in this liquid. We know it's under pressure because when we open the cap, we hear psh, the pressure comes out. We reduce the, the pressure in this bottle and therefore the amount of gas that can stay dissolved in the liquid is, is less than the amount that can be dissolved when, we're, when it's in uh, contact with a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide. So that gas comes out in the form of bubbles. You've all seen this and this is an analogous to what goes on in, in a human, the gas space would be our, our breathing gas and our lungs. Uh, we breathe gas at elevated pressures when we're diving. We have to have our gas delivered to us at the pressure that we're at so that we can ventilate our lungs. And therefore, the gases which are then at higher partial pressure become dissolved in our body tissues, which are like the liquid here. Most of our body tissues are, um, are aqueous, sort of watery tissues. And then when we decompress, which is releasing the cap off the bottle, when we come up, when we ascend to the surface, we may or may not get bubble formation. And depending on the number of those bubbles and where they form, that may or may not result in decompression sickness. OK, so now we're going to talk about how that gas gets into uh, the body tissues, because this is one of the most important things for planning our decompression. We need to know how much gas is getting into the tissues so that we can regulate it, its washout and the bubble formation. So what I've got here, this is meant to be the lungs. This is an alveolus in the lungs. Um, this is the gas where gas exchange occurs. This is meant to be the, uh, the bloodstream. So we've got venous blood coming to the lungs, flowing past the lungs and then via the heart. Um, to a, the body tissues and I'm representing one tissue here by this square. So this is gas and in, in gas form and these are liquids. The blood's a liquid, the tissues are a liquid and we have gas dissolved in it. These, these are meant to represent nitrogen atoms, if you will. So here we are at one atmosphere. I mean, pressure is the situation we're in at the moment. We've got one atmosphere of gas in our lungs. 
Um, if we're breathing air, it's 79% nitrogen. It's diluted a little bit by water vapor as it comes through the respiratory uh, tree down into the alveolus. So we end up with about 0.74 of an atmosphere of nitrogen here. The liquid, uh, that's the blood, will have gas in equilibrium with that 0.74 atmospheres of, of nitrogen. This system is made for gas exchange, so gas exchange across here is, is, is very efficient. So this, this liquid is, has 0.74 of an atmosphere of nitrogen. The tissues also have that same partial pressure of nitrogen is dissolved in them, 0.74. So everything's at equilibrium. There's no net exchange of the inert gases that we breathe. This system is set up to exchange gases, so the oxygen that we, we need to metabolize and the carbon dioxide, that's the waste product, but, so they're moving back and forth, but um, under normal circumstances, there's no net transfer of an inert gas. All right, but if we dive down to, say, uh, 66 feet, uh, 20 meters, where the pressure is now three atmospheres, the gas we're breathing will be at three atmospheres, so there's three times as much of it in this, in this gas space. And the blood that is flowing past the lungs will rapidly come into equilibrium with that three atmospheres. So we'll now have three times as much gas dissolved in this liquid. And I've tried to indicate by having these molecules here further apart than in here that the amount of gas in the liquid is, is really quite small in comparison to what's here. Uh, nitrogen or helium, the gases we breathe, for instance, are only about 1% soluble in the blood. So if there's 100 mils of gas, a gas space here has 100 mils of gas in it, um, 100 mils of blood can only hold about 1 mil of, of gas, um, so only about 1% soluble. And that's important because as the gas moves from the lungs into the blood, it doesn't really deplete what's here. It only really represents a very small amount. And of course, we're always replenishing that by breathing. Um, so this equilibrium, this comes to equilibrium very quickly. That blood trans, uh, flows via the heart to the, tish, to the tissues, and then gas can diffuse from this higher area of partial pressure to this air, lower area of, of partial pressure which I've indicated by these arrows, that gas will diffuse into the tissue down its partial pressure gradient. So some molecules will move from the blood into the tissues. Now, the inert gas, the nitrogen is equally soluble in this blood as in the tissue, roughly, depends on the type of tissue. So when that gas moves into the tissue, it's depleting what's in the blood considerably. So the, the blood, and the tissues don't come to equilibrium um, immediately. Well, they do at, this, at the capillary level, but the tissues don't come into equilibrium with, with the uh, arterial blood or the uh, lungs immediately because the diffusion of gas in there depletes this blood of gas, so you need more to arrive there. So more blood's got to flow through, and it's got to translate, diffuse into the tissue, then more has to be delivered. So, the rate at which this comes to equilibrium, the tissue with the gas we're breathing, is dependent very strongly on the blood supply. So more blood has to, has to get through there. So this, the, the, the important point here is that this e equilibration between the lungs and the blood is, is very fast, and we tend to ignore it in diving. We think if we go down to 20 meters depth, uh, we think that our arterial blood will come into equilibrium with what we're breathing, essentially instantaneously. It's not instantaneous, but it's fast enough that we can ignore it. But this equilibration at the tissue is, is slow, largely because we have to wait for enough blood to flow through the tissues to deliver enough gas. So when we're diving, if we want to try and estimate how much gas has gone into our tissues, we, we are talking about usually this process here, blood tissue equilibration. And one of the ways that we model that is just to use a simple exponential equation that the form of, of, of this uptake isn't, that isn't terribly important. But what I've got here, I'm going to have a few graphs that look like this. I've got time on the x-axis and I've got pressure on the y-axis. So that pressure could be the ambient pressure, which I've indicated here, or the partial pressure of gases in the tissue. So here's, our, here's a, a four atmosphere, so 100 feet or 30 meter dive. We leave from one, one atmosphere, we go down to four atmospheres, and we stay there for 50 minutes and then make an ascent back to the surface to one atmosphere. The partial pressure of um, nitrogen in the um, arterial blood 
just tracks with the ambient pressure. Um, for practical purposes, it just goes immediately up to its new, the new partial pressure. So we're at four atmospheres, we're breathing 79% nitrogen. It's diluted a little bit by water vapor, so we end up with about 3.11 atmospheres of nitrogen in our, in our lungs and in the arterial blood. Um, but the tissue makes a slow approach to that new arterial pressure, determined largely by blood flow, but some other things. And we characterize that with half times in diving. This is a 20 minute half time tissue. It's taking 20 minutes to get halfway from where it started at to where it's going, which is the arterial. Then it makes, it takes another, in another 20 minutes, it gets halfway of the remaining distance. So it's making an exponential approach. That's a, not a bad model of what actually goes on in the tissue. It looks quite a lot like that. Um, I just want to say that we characterize the body with a lot of compartments with different rates of gas uptake, uh, which will depend on the different blood flows. So here I've drawn five different um, compartments of tissue with different blood flows indicated by the different weights of the arrows. So this, this compartment that has a high blood flow will equilibrate with the gas we're breathing very quickly, and this one with low blood flow will take a long time. But for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to look at one gas exchange rate. So that would be one of, the, the, one of these compartments which we use to characterize what's going on in the whole body. So for simpli simplicity, we're just looking at, well, for instance, the middle one, a sort of medium e exchange rate compartment. So back to the slide that we had before. Um, I've gotten rid of the arterial trace just to make it a little bit clearer. So here's our, our dive to 100 feet and return to the surface. This is how the gas partial pressure is uh, changed in uh, the one compartment that we're interested in for the time being. Um, as we make the ascent, at some point, we may reduce the ambient pressure below the sum of all the dissolved gas uh, partial pressures in the tissue. And when we do that, we call that situation supersaturation. So that's when uh, tissue pressure is greater than ambient, or as I've written it here, tissue minus ambient is greater than zero. And I've indicated the maximum supersaturation by this red bar. This supersaturation is the necessary requirement for bubble formation. Doesn't mean bubbles will form, um, but as we've learned over the years in decompression physiology, they almost always do. Um, but you must have supersaturation for bubbles to form. So that is the releasing the pressure so that the pressure inside the bottle, the physical pressure is less than the dissolved gas pressure in the beer. Um, so those bubbles come out of solution. Um, of course, I only indicated the maximum uh, supersaturation with the red bar, but for this whole period indicated by all these bars, the yellow ones including the red, the tissue is supersaturated, so bubbles can be forming and growing during this ent entire period. So this is sort of the driving force for bubble formation. Our simplest decompression models and our most prevalent ones are the Haldane style models, and they only look at the maximum level of supersaturation. And they try and control that level of supersaturation because that's what causes bubble formation, and therefore if we keep that amount of supersaturation low, we should have less bubble formation and we should have less incidence of decompression sickness. So in a Haldane style decompression, um, what we want to do is, is keep the supersaturation low and the way we do that in practice is since supersaturation is a relationship between the ambient pressure and that's the depth um, and, a, and a tissue pressure, we have some safe ascent depth, which is a function of this tissue pressure. Um, so for any given pressure, tissue pressure, there's an ambient pressure or a depth which is safe to go to and, we're, and we expect, or we, from empirical observation, will result in very low incidence of decompression sickness. So we impose a safe ascent depth, which as you can see here, it's just moving in parallel with the tissue partial pressure of gas as it goes out, and we can never ascend past that safe ascent depth. So in this case, instead of going all the way to the surface, um, we've had to make some decompression stops. So we've ascended to the safe ascent depth at, at six meters here. We wait at, at six meters while some gas washes out of the tissue, and as that tissue partial pressure of gas 
reduces, the safe ascent depth gets shallower and eventually it gets three meters shallower or 10 feet shallower and we can come up to uh, three meters or 10 feet and we wait there until we can come up to the surface. This was the uh, advance that Haldane made. Uh, it was by convention we do these stops at 10 feet or three meters, which is something he started. You could use any other depth um, increment that you wanted, but we, we tend to use 10 feet. And that safe ascent depth can take a, a number of different forms. What Haldane um, worked out was that he found that the pressure, that the ambient pressure can be r roughly half of the tissue pressure, or he, the tissue pressure can be twice ambient pressure without a high incidence of decompression sickness. So that's the two to one ratio that some of you may, may have heard of. So safe ascent depth equals tissue tension divided by two. And uh, he determined that by experiments in goats. He took um, goats, put them in a chamber full of air, uh, pressurized it, uh, let them stay at that pressure for several hours long enough, he thought, for all the tissues in the goat's body to be um, equilibrated with the new air pressure, and then would decompress them to the surface and see how many got bent. And um, from 33 feet, two atmospheres to the surface, one atmosphere, you've got almost no goats would get bent. Um, but from three atmospheres, say 66 feet, 20 meters to the surface, you would get quite, you maybe get six out of 10 goats would get bent. And so in looking at all his data, he decided that, well, the, the two to one ratio is about what works. But there are other forms of this safe ascent depth. We don't use ratios much anymore. Um, they have some limitations. Um, but the, uh, it's more common now to use a safe ascent depth that looks something like this. Um, so it still has tissue pressure in it, but you usually subtract an offset and divide by another value. So it's the same sort of thing. Um, it's, a, it's a linear relationship rather than just a ratio. Um, this is based on um, sort of the M value work of uh, uh, Workman did, Robert Workman did in the, in the US Navy in the 60s. Um, this exact form of this equation is what you see in the Bullman model which is um, the basis of a lot of uh, desktop decompression software, a lot of dive computers. Um, though, uh, so the Bullman model is a very typical Haldane style decompression. So that's as far as we're gonna go into, into Haldane models. Um, I wanna move on to a, another type of decompression um, model that's in a, in a lot of software these days. And these, the, I call these bubble counters. Um, they're um, the two common ones that you may have heard of are uh, VPM, the variable permeability model, and RGBM, reduced gradient bubble model, which is a, is a derivative of VPM. Um, what you've got when you um, have this supersaturation, the way these models work is rather than just looking at supersaturation saying we have to limit that, they go another step and they say, well, how many bubbles with that form. So the model's just a little bit more complex. And for every amount of supersaturation, um, you get a different number of bubbles forming under the, the model, under the, the, bubble, the bubble formation model that is the, is the, the core of, of VPM and IGBM. And what I'm trying to want to illustrate here with these bubbles that just appeared um, are that when bubbles first form, they form at different sizes. And the reason why, oh, didn't mean to do that. Um, the, the model that underlies these says that the more supersaturation you get, the more bubbles will form. And the reason for this is it's very much harder to form these very small bubbles than it is to form the slightly larger bubbles. So you, a, a, a reduced amount of supersaturation will still form these larger bubbles, but not these smaller ones. And this is, because of um, a, a, um, it's a property of surface tension. Bubbles are an, an expandable gas phase, so they're um, at roughly ambient pressure, and the larger bubbles will be very close to ambient pressure, but there's also a pressure due to surface tension inside a bubble. You've all seen surface tension. It's what forms a meniscus on a glass. When you were a kid, you probably tried to fill a glass of water up above the, the top, and you can get that curved, meniscus on top and the water doesn't run out the sides. Um, that's due to surface tension and that's because at a gas liquid interface, so if this is my glass of water here that I filled up over the surface and it's air above, 
at a gas interface, liquid molecules are attracted more to each other than they are to the, to the gas phase. And that's, that property is called surface tension, so that you, that attractive force stops the water from running over the edge of the glass. If you have a, a gas interface that's a bubble, where now the inside of my hands is the gas phase, and I've got liquid out here, and those liquid molecules of that interface are, are attracted to each other by surface tension, that squeezes the bubble down, so it increases the pressure inside the bubble. And that effect is larger the smaller the bubble is. So the pressure inside these, inside very small bubbles, so the smallest bubbles that we can form in, in, in the laboratory, um, can be hundreds of atmospheres above um, ambient pressure. But once the bubbles grow to a reasonable size, I'm talking about the sort of size that you might be able to detect with Doppler when you, when you listen for bubbles in people's bloodstream, the pressure inside them is very low. So anyway, the way these VPM, RGBM style models work, the bubble counter models, is for any given supersaturation, you get a larger number of bubbles. And in the very earliest implementations of these, so the Yount and Hoffman model, the original VPM, uh, that was simply it. There was a cutoff number of bubbles under their model that, was, that you would allow for decompression. So if you got 100 bubbles under their models, that was a safe decompression, but 101 was, was unsafe. Um, Nowadays, they've just been made a little bit more sophisticated. As I said before, bubbles can form and grow through um, this, this whole phase where you're supersaturated, as, as indicated by the bars. So you get your maximum supersaturation, gives you the number of bubbles. But then they'll just take this area in here, so they integrate this curve. But they're just basically the area is the height of all these bars. And they'll multiply that number by the number of bubbles, and they'll give you an index of the total volume of bubbles, so the number there are by how long they can grow for, and that gives you another, another index, and then they have a safe value of that. That value might be 3,000 is good, 3,001 is bad. So the way these models work is you do a trial decompression, you see how many bubbles form, how much volume, they, volume, because it's not really a volume they'll get to, and if that's no good, then you need to reduce the number of bubbles, so you do a decompression with a smaller supersaturation, so you try a smaller supersaturation, you multiply that by this total area, and if that comes out under the critical value, then that's a good decompression. Um, so a very simple bubble model based on the, on the formation of bubbles. There are, there are other types of bubble models. Um, out in the recreational technical area, you won't see these much, but there are, uh, oh, so again, the smaller, Smaller supersaturation, the small bubbles didn't form, only the large one, larger ones formed, um, so that there's less bubbles to grow, so you'll, you'll have a, a, a better decompression under these models. Um, oh, I was getting ahead of myself. So, once you've done that trial and you found this allowable supersaturation, that imposes a safe ascent depth, so you just never allow your ascent to proceed beyond a safe ascent depth, but in this case, um, it's just simply tissue minus some value, so some constant supersaturation. But once you've done this calculation, it works very much like a Haldanian model. You've said, okay, we've now got a safe ascent depth and we just decompress according to that. So actually the schedules look in some ways similar, although they typically start with deeper decompression stops than Haldane models, but otherwise they, they behave very much like the Haldanian models as far as um, the shape of your decompression. Um, there are other bubble models. I uh, got a little bit ahead of myself before. You're um, not going to see these out in the recreational field much, um, but there are bubble dynamic models which actually um, look at the growth of bubbles in tissue, um, doing a much more rigorous um, application of the diffusion equations. So, um, what I've shown here is uh, pressure again, time. Here's our dive profile. Here's one compartment, the, the tissue tension. We've looked exactly at how bubbles um, grow during this period of supersaturation. So the bubbles form during the initial decompression. Um, they grow by Boyle's law each time we ascend a bit further at each of the stops. Um, they grow by taking up gas from the tissue for a while and then they start shrinking. And we use the volume of these bubbles to um, give us some 
indicator of risk of decompression sickness. Um, these are largely used research in the Navy and in NASA, um, and uh, a little bit more computationally in intensive than some of the other models, but we use bubble models as well in the Navy. Um, the, all these bubble models, whether they're the bubble counters or the, or the bubble dynamic models, have a particular characteristic of, of distribution of decompression times. And the principal characteristic of these is that um, they usually have a deeper first decompression stop. And depending on the model, they may actually skew the total amount of decompression time you do deeper as well. So may have stops 10, 20, 30 feet deeper than a Haldanian model, um, but they may also spend much more time at those deeper stops. Um, and the premise for this is that deep stops limit the uh, uh, bubble profusion size and duration. So if we go back to this picture, um, we had this bubble form during this first ascent. This is bubble volume here. Um, and then it grew and got bigger and bigger. The premise is if you have deeper stops, you may either not form this bubble or keep it much smaller so that it only ever grows to a smaller size and therefore is less likely to cause decompression sickness. So, but they all have this same characteristic and this um, same premise. Uh, we wanted to know whether this would work. Deep stops decompression absolutely works. But what we were interested in the Navy, because we were, we were very enamored with our bubble models, was whether it was going to be a more efficient way to decompress. Um, people have, this um, idea got uh, popularized uh, in the, uh, in the uh, 90s with uh, Richard Pyle. He showed this picture next door, who um, was one of the modern proponents of deep stops, but um, probably one of the earliest um, Investigations of it was in association with the uh, pearl divers in northwestern Australia in the 60s, um, where they were doing what looked like a deep, was a multi level dive profile. To typically, they were diving on air to 300 feet, but then they would um, spend some time on the bottom, perhaps an hour, and then they would work shallower in a multi level profile and then decompress out very rapidly. And a researcher at, at Biowood University, University of Adelaide, um, a fellow called Brian Hills, um, looked at this and um, as a result felt that decompression would be better uh, described by bubble models and he um, put together the thermodynamic bubble model which is among the earliest of the of the bubble decompression models and, and it has deep stops. Um, so not sure whether it really was more efficient or whether these were resistant guys, whether the uh, broom graveyard full of divers was the, were the people for whom this didn't work. Um, but um, it, it's certainly something that can work, but is it more efficient? What I mean by efficiency is will, if you do a deep stops decompression, can you decompress more quickly than you could on a traditional Haldane decompression um, uh, profile, which is what we were interested in for the Navy, with the same risk of decompression sickness, or if you're doing what's much more amenable to scientific study is if you do a decompression of exactly the same duration, but one's deep stops and one's shallow stops, will you have less incidence of decompression sickness? And that was the experiment we undertook in the US Navy. So here are the two schedules we, we looked at. In yellow, we went to 170 feet for 30 minutes, cold water, divers working, worst case scenario for diving, high risk of decompression sickness. This is what air dives. Um, so very simple dives to look at, what, at what's going on. And then we, um, decompressed out either on a traditional shallow stop schedule, very long decompression times, because we're doing air decompression, you need long decompression times if you're going to work at depth and if you're going to be cold during decompression. Um, the advantage of very long decompression times is you can then make a deep stop schedule that's very different, that spends a lot of time deeper. So if there's going to be effect, you're going to see it. Two minutes, a two minute stop somewhere deeper doesn't doesn't really do anything. It's not enough time to manifest any, any uh, real difference in, in a decompression profile. So what we did, two schedules, exact same depth and time, same duration of decompression, but different distribution of uh, deep stops. And this happened to be um, based on one of the bubble dynamic models. And we dived them and saw which had the most uh, incidence of decompression sickness. Um, we did it in the... Uh, Ocean Simulation Facility at NEDU. This is kind of essentially my office. Actually, my office is just about here. Um, but this is the wet pot of the um, Ocean Simulation Facility. There's a big cham saturation chamber 
facility up above, but uh, this is a 55,000 gallon chamber. We're, the moment here it's open, and we're setting up, putting a treadmill in, you put in whatever equipment, then swing this door closed, these 100 hydraulic pins lock in place, make it waterproof, and it's uh, rated to 1,000 psi, a little over 2,000 feet. Um, so we can simulate all sorts of diving conditions. In this case, we had divers riding cycle ergometers, uh, wearing just t-shirt and, um, and shorts in 84 degree Fahrenheit water, which gets quite cold after three or four hours, um, breathing surface supplied gas. And we just man-dived it to see which was better. Um, to our dismay, this was the results that we got. Um, that on the shallow stops profile, it was extremely safe. Um, a little safer than we estimated. Uh, we got three DCS in, in nearly 200 dives. Uh, one was fairly serious spinal. The other two were very, very mild pain, only onset very late. Um, probably the sort of thing that some people would ignore, but nonetheless it was DCS. On the deep stops, which we assumed was going to be much better, we got uh, 10 DCS in, in nearly 200 dives. It actually was 11 call. One of them I don't think is DCS, so I've taken it out. But in either case, it was um, significantly more decompression sickness during the deep stops profile. Um, this is not what we expected to see. We were, we were all ready to go ahead with, with bubble models for decompression in the Navy. So what's going on there? Why doesn't this work? Oh, just quit very quickly. We also measured VGE, so venous gas emboli. So these are the bubbles that you can detect in venous blood using ultrasonic methods. You can uh, either detect them with Doppler, where you hear the bubbles, or in our case, we use uh, 2D e echocardiography, where you look, image the chambers of the heart with ultrasound, and actually look at the bubbles returning in the venous blood to the right side of the heart. That's before they're pumped to the lungs, where they're generally filtered out. Um, when you look at, when you detect bubbles by either method, uh, you usually grade them accord, according to a sort of semi-quantitative scale. Um, so what I've shown here, this is the traditional shallow stop schedule. You, have, you can have grades uh, zero through four. You, zero means you're just not seeing any bubbles in the heart. Four means that you're seeing so many bubbles in the heart, in the heart chambers that you can't see anything else. Um, very, uh, generally, if you have zero grade bubbles, you, rare, you don't see decompression sickness. It happens very rarely, but, but generally zero bubbles, no decompression sickness. People have grade four bubbles, there's about a 12% incidence of decompression sickness when, when you have grade four bubbles and there's not a great relationship in between. In between it's like, well, it kind of goes either way. So it is associated with the risk of decompression sickness, but somewhat weakly. But what you can see here in the traditional shallow stop schedule is fairly evenly distributed. Quite a lot of people with um, zero, one, two, three, four, grade for four bubbles. In the deep stops, it's quite different. We saw almost no grade zero bubbles and we saw a a great many grade four bubbles. So, uh, so the bubbles we saw were in accord with what we saw with, with clinical decompression sickness as diagnosed by the diving medical officers. So what's going on? Um, believe me, we've been scratching our head about this for about five years since we finished that study. We finally put this out. We've published it in a few places. We finally put out the full report uh, in a NED technical report. I'm sorry, I haven't put the number down. I should have. Um, not sure if that's available on Rubicon yet. I think it's too recent, but uh, it will be there eventually. And um, you can certainly get it from our library if you contact the librarian. What I'm, what I'm showing here, here are the schedules we dived. So 170 feet for 30 minutes, the shallow stop schedule in yellow, the, red, the deep stops in, in red. And down here I'm showing the super saturation in a Fast compartment, I, I just chose 10 minute time constants, about six minute half time compartment to represent fast compartments. So this is the, uh, the power for bubble growth. This is super saturation in the, in the, in the uh, shallow stop schedule in yellow and in the red stops, in the deep stops in red. Just to remind you that those, that graph on the bottom is just the height of these bars. So I've just done the subtraction of ambient from tissue for you. So this is the, the driving force for bubble formation. You can analyze this with a bubble model as well, but you have to make all sorts of assumptions of things that you don't know about, the bubble density, the diffusivity, surface tension. So just, but you can figure out what's going on just by looking at the supersaturation, which is the requirement for bubble formation. So 
here we go. The shallow stops schedule a lot more supersaturation initially, as you would expect, because you come up much shallower, and we're talking about a fast compartment that's taken up a lot of gas during the dive. And the deep stops will result in much less supersaturation and therefore less driving force for bubble formation. So this deep stops schedule in a fast compartment must have less bubble formation than the shallow stop schedule. It's just the physics of it, much less bubble formation. But it doesn't manifest as less decompression sickness. It seems that controlling bubble formation in the fast compartments with deep stops is not necessary. So presumably our 30 foot a minute ascent rate is enough to, to deal with the, with, the fast, with the fast compartments. We look at the same analysis in the slow compartments though, and you'll see that we have much more supersaturation in the deep stop schedule than in the shallow stop schedule. And that's because during the deep stops in our slow compartment, here I'm using a half time about 120 minutes, time constant of 160, during the deep stops, you're still taking up gas. They didn't take up much gas during the bottom phase, but um, they continue to take up gas during the deep stops. And then later in the schedule, you end up with more supersaturation. So no supersaturation until we went from, uh, from uh, 20 to, well, as this looks like, went from about 40 to 30 feet, and then to 20 feet, and then to 10 feet. Um, and, um, and this is in accord with, with the incidence of decompression sickness in the bubbles that we saw. So it seems that the uptake of gas into the slow compartments um, that you have during deep stops is bad and that results in more, decom and, and results in more decompression sickness. So of the type of diving we did, controlling in the fast compartments wasn't as important as controlling in the deep compartments. And if you just add together the, total, the area under these curves for the shallow and fast, it turns out that there's much more supersaturation in the in the deep stops um, schedule than the shallow stops in accord with what we saw. So is it, was this specific to just the schedule we did? I mean, this doesn't look quite like what uh, a technical diver would do, um, but we did, I did that same analysis on, on other schedules. So he, here's a, um, a VPM schedule for the same dive. You would start a little bit deeper. Uh, you would ascend a little bit faster. So this was a, just VPM with the parameters adjusted so I got the same total decompression time. And if you do the same analysis on that VPM schedule, you get the exact same result. More total supersaturation across compartments because the slow ones are taking up gas. Um, so I would suspect that this would give you the same result. I actually analyzed half a million schedules. Uh, every sort of five minute block of time moved around every different schedule. And what you find is with every deep stop schedule, you get this same thing where you end up with more supersaturation. You can, if you've got deep stops, you control the fast compartments. Um, but as we show with this schedule here, where you don't do that, where you come shallow straight away, we had just one series DCS, very safe schedule. Um, you don't need to do that. Um, so everything that had more time skewed deep always had this analyzed out the same way. So I suspect that we would find with every deep stop schedule that we would look at um, that we would get the same result. I think this is fairly, um, is going to apply across a lot, um, virtually any deep stop schedule. But everyone says, oh, well, you know, you didn't do the 120 foot stop. There's a magic, you know, two minute stop at 120 you've got to do. Um, and, and nothing else. And of course, that would be fine. If you only spent two minutes there, you wouldn't take up much gas, um, you know, and, then, and uh, you wouldn't have the bad part of the deep stops. But what we showed here with this schedule where you don't do that, that works perfectly well. So a two minute deep stop and nothing else um, uh, is probably not going to hurt you, but you don't really need to do it either. That is as if you're controlling your ascent rate properly. If you're using your deep stops to have a nice controlled ascent rate where you're just sliding up three meters at a time, that's probably a very good thing. Um, all right, so I think that is all I've got about uh, the, the deep stops, and some of you will have heard that before. Um, this is to remind me that I'm moving on to the next part of the talk, but also I guess I should point out that um, I spend a lot of time decompressing as well. Uh, not going to just make the divers at NEDU do it. Here's a, one, of what, one of the habitats in Wakulla Springs. Um, we're decompressed, we're in the middle of a or to hopefully towards the end of an eight or ten hour decompression from a, from a long dive into, into Wakulla Springs. That's me, it's my buddy Jim Miller. Uh, unfortunately, that was the last time we ever decompressed together. All right, I'm going to move on to talk about gas switching. This is somewhat relevant to, to rebreather diving in, in particular because it's a little bit harder to make these gas switches, although most of us have offboard gas now so we can switch. 
Simon talked about this in his, his uh, talk this morning, T talked about switching from a heliox or trimix mixture on the bottom to nitrox for decompression. It's fairly common in technical diving. The pros are it's cheaper to breathe nitrox than heliox. Certainly if you're in open circuit mode, that becomes important. There is a belief that switching to nitrox after, so we're breathing heliox on the bottom, we switch to nitrox, whether that be air or 32% nitrox link during decompression, that that will accelerate decompression, or maybe not, we want to look into that. And the cons are that there is, it may cause or complicate decompression sickness making that nitrox, or not. So we want to talk about those. All right, the premise for this, uh, we've got a nitrox diver here and a heliox diver here, um, both just left the surface and gone down to depth. And the heliox diver is taking on gas more quickly than the nitrox diver. That's the premise of this, that helium gets into the body quicker and also out of the body quicker than nitrogen does. We'll see whether or not that's true in a moment. But you can exploit this the, when you're decompressing, there's different rates of, of gas exchange to modify your decompression. So that we now have the diver who's, who's full of helium. If he switches to breathing nitrox during decompression, he'll also wash out helium quickly and take up nitrogen more slowly so that they'll, he'll end up with less gas in his body, so therefore he should be able to decompress more quickly. I've graphed that here. This is pressure here, ambient pressure. This is an isobaric switch at 10 atmospheres. I happen to do this for, an, for another talk. If we were at 10 atmospheres and we've been breathing helium, we have a gas part. Partial pressure, partial pressure total of gases in our body here just below 10 atmospheres. If we start breathing nitrox, we'll have helium wash out very quickly because we're now not breathing any helium, so gases exchange based on the partial pressure, zero in our lungs, lots in our tissue. It'll wash out quickly, but we'll also start taking on nitrogen. But if we were to take that on more slowly than we wash out helium, here's the sum of the gases here. For a period, we'll be quite undersaturated. Eventually, we'll come back to the same level we're at, but for a while, will have less than the sort of just under 10 atmospheres of gas. So we can exploit that theoretically to decompress. Um, we, you know, if this was the dive we were doing, we could ascend to here with no bubble formation. So that's the premise. Does this happen or not? It does in some parts of the body, but why would helium and nitrogen have different half times? One is helium diffuses faster than nitrogen. So in most cases, this diffusion process is not important for the rate of uptake. It's mainly blood flow, but in some tissues, diffusion may be important. So where, where that's the case, helium will exchange faster than nitrogen. But also helium is, in some tissues, particularly fat, less soluble than nitrogen. So nitrogen is about five times more soluble than helium in fat. In aqueous tissues, that's not very different. So if this tissue can hold five times more nitrogen, and it's dependent on the blood flow for that nitrogen to get there, it'll take, you have to get five times more blood there for the tissue for it to come to equilibrium with, with what you're breathing. So it will take five times uh, longer to come to equilibrium than helium. So there, there are some places in the body where this exchange may be uh, different. And you can actually see this if you're looking at whole body washout. So this is uh, breathing into a bag and analyzing the gas that you exhale. So after a helium dive or a nitrogen dive, you, you come to the surface, you start breathing oxygen and you collect the gas. Um, this is just the fraction. So not the amount, but the percentage that's washed out. Um, this, this is helium here. You can see that you wash it out more quickly than the nitrogen. Um, and you know, the nitrogen, it takes longer to get to the sort of 100% washout. You notice the time course though, it's, it's over hours. This is probably related to the, to the nitrogen washout from fat, which is a very slowly exchanging tissue. Um, whether or not this is relevant to uh, the rest of diving or to decompression at all is, is what I want to talk about. The whole concept of accelerated decompression by switching from helium to nitrogen uh, seems to stem from this paper by Keller and Bullman, Journal of Applied Physiology. Some very interesting dives in this paper, um, but they don't really demonstrate accelerated decompression with gas switching. They were man dives with sequential changes in inert gas, so principally helium on the bottom, then switch to nitrox mixtures and then oxygen during decompression. They also increase the oxygen fraction during decompression, so less inert gas, and we know that that accelerates decompression it itself. And they compared these dives they did, which were quite interesting dives, but they didn't, they compared them to air schedules from the US Navy dive manual and extrapolations from it that weren't tested at the same time, and in fact have never been tested. So they said these dives with really high oxygen decompression were much faster than air schedules, so it's not really telling you that the gas switching is what made it quicker. 
But as you all uh, probably know, it, uh, the, the Bullman model, which a lot of us use, it's in desktop software on the computer, it, it assumes that helium exchange is 2.6 times faster than nitrogen in, in all body tissues, in all compartments. And based kind of on that work and other work that Bullman did at the same time. Um, so this is easy to see if you play around with your desktop decompression software, the Heliops dive to 250 feet. We come out, we do some stops, and then at, at 70 feet, we switch to one of two different mixtures. We, we could go to 50% oxygen and helium, or we could go to 50% oxygen and nitrogen. So the brown is the Heliops side, and we go to oxygen, both dives at 20 feet. But you can see even with this modest gas switch, that if we switch to nitrogen, the model will tell us that we can accel accelerate our decompression. We can come out in much shorter time, even though there's really not a great deal of time on nitrogen. So that's very characteristic of the Bullman model. All the, the des other desktop software you've got, like RGBM or VPM, uses this same compartment structure and a very similar effect. So you'll get this in all your, all your software, at least the ones that I've looked at. Um, you'll get this acceleration if you go on the nitrogen. So is that true? An easy way to test that, or, or a more scientifically amenable way to test that, would be to take exactly the same schedule and either have a gas switch or not, so a helium dive, and then decompress out on, on heliox, or else switch to nitrox, and do the same schedule, and see which one has the higher risk of decompression sickness. Um, and this was in fact done, and uh, this was some of the early development for the Mark 16 Mod 1 uh, rebreather, which is what the US Navy uses for its uh, explosive ordnance disposal. Um, so this is when we were changing from a 0.7 set point rig to a, a 1.3 PO2 set point rig. Um, this was going to be an emergency procedure, so we, this was tested. Uh, it was done at Naval Medical Research Institute. There's the technical report number, 9809. Um, it, this is just about a paragraph in, in the report. It was meant to be published later, but never was. Um, although I have all this data in my, in my lab. So they did this. So um, when they just stayed on helium, so this is 1.3 PO2 set points. So 1.3 PO2 oxygen in helium. So when they did that, that's the brown trace. They got, just did 32 dyes. So it's a small study, but there was 3% decompression sickness, 192. The alternative was to switch to nitrox at the first stop, 110 feet. So now it was 1.3 atmospheres oxygen and nitrogen for the decompression out and there was 19% decompression sickness on those dyes. So not enough to be significant, um, but pretty much says you're not accelerating your decompression with that gas switch. Uh, and there's some other data that's, um, some animal data that, that tells you more or less the same thing, that, that there's at least no difference and certainly not, um, and probably worse. So is helium uptake and washout faster? everywhere, like, like these models that we, we use our desktop software say. Well, this is something that I looked at when I was back at the University in Adelaide. Uh, it's published in a few different places, but the comparison between helium and nitrogen is only in abstract form, UHM. Uh, basically, in animals, I did sequential breathing of, um, of uh, air, then heliox, then air, and then measured um, helium and nitrogen in the blood going into tissues and out of tissues, so in the arterial and venous blood, and, anal and analyzed it using uh, gas chromatograph, and uh, did it in all sorts of places, but here's just one set of data. This is for the hind limbs, so this is the thigh muscle, in a sh the thigh of a sheep, so largely muscle, a little bit of skin, a little bit of bone. The top graph here, so th this is meant to indicate they were breathing air before the study, then helium for a while, then back to air, and of course they continue to breathe air after the study, the animals survive. Uh, this is the arterial uh, helium content here, and then this is the venous as it, uh, slowly approaches the, uh, the arterial content. And the black, so that's the blue dots, the black is, is fitting a model, uh, a, uh, a, st a structural model to uh, try and, and say how is the gas exchange. Not a single exponential in this case, so that doesn't matter. There's the same data, same animals um, for nitrogen. So as they're breathing helium and taking up helium, they're also washing out nitrogen. So this is the arterial and this is the tissue. It's a bit noisier, it's harder to measure nitrogen because it keeps getting contaminated with the air. Um, like trying to analyze water while you're in a swimming pool, um, keeps getting everywhere. And, uh, but what you can see here, just even looking, inspecting it, is that the gas exchange is about the same. These are virtually mirror images of each other. The uptake of helium and the washout of nitrogen. In actual fact, if you calculate the half time for the one compartment of the model that represents the tissue, because it's actually a multi-compartment model, you can see that the half times 
but the two gases are very similar. In fact, helium is a little bit slower um, rather than a little bit faster um, wash, out, wash in and wash out than nitrogen. And, and across a lot of parts of the body, this is what you find. There really isn't this separation, except in, in perhaps fat and a few diffusion-limited tissues. I'm going to just finish with one slide and we'll go to questions. Okay, so it doesn't accelerate decompression, but does switching to nitrox do us any good? And, and this is just a slide of two sets of data that I put together. There's been a similar analysis, slightly different, by the people at, at Duke um, looking at, at some similar sort of data. Um, but this is, this is the data on this side from the uh, development of the Mark 16 decompression model, helium decompression model. Um, where it's all heliox decompression. The, the Mark 16, as the Navy uses it, doesn't have a means for swap changing your diluent gas. So if you're breathing heliox, you're breathing it for the whole dive. And then this is it's some data from DCIM and the development of their surface supplied heliox diving tables. So in those tables, they have heliox on the bottom, but they switch to air at their first decompression stop, and then oxygen at, at six or nine meters, I can't remember. So there's substantial differences in these two diving modalities, but this is kind of interesting and, suggest, and just really food for thought rather than proof. But so but we did, there's a similar number of dives, nearly uh, 999 dives in, in the development of the Heliox table, 715 in the development of the surface supplied tables, and about the same incidence of decompression sickness, 25 here, 34 here. Interesting thing was though, in the gas switch, they had one type 1 DCS out of those 25. All the rest were pain only, fairly you know, um, easy to treat, not very scary decompression sickness. In the Heliox tables though, same instance of decompression sickness, but over half of them were type 2 and almost all of those were in the brain. They were all reasonably worrisome decompression sickness. So just leaving with thought, maybe switching to nitrox doesn't accelerate your decompression, but maybe it results in a more, a less scary form of decompression sickness. This study wasn't designed to prove that, but it is something to think about. And if you talk about people who've done a lot of decompression work, development, so people like Phil Hamilton when he was still with us, he'd say, oh yeah, you know, or Ron Nishi still, you know, say, oh yeah, you've got to get off, off the Heliox at some point. Um, it's going to make your decompression safer. Um, anecdote, but people who, who know what they're talking about. So summary, helium nitrogen exchange at the same rate in many tissues doesn't accelerate decompression making that switch, but maybe it results in less type 2 decompression sickness. So I'll leave it there. We've got four minutes or something for questions. If you know, no one's got any?